Imagine moving to a new place, making the decision to leave the home you've always known, and saying goodbye to your loved ones, all with the hope of finding opportunities to support yourself and your family. But upon entry, you're met with keep out signs and angry mobs. You're greeted by laws that don't protect you and prevent you from voting, owning land, marrying the person you love, and seeing your relatives again. Asians were denied many rights that the U.S. Constitution promised as a democratic society. Would you want to leave? Or would you fight for the chance to build your home and insist that you belong? Despite centuries of living on this land, Asian Americans have been perpetually viewed as foreigners rather than true citizens. From legislation institutionalized by politicians to actions taken by the public, we have been pushed to the fringes and treated as outsiders. However, we continue to resist being pushed out, retaining the same tenacity that drove our ancestors here to make America our home. Though coming from different countries and cultures, the pioneering Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Indians, Filipinos, and others who arrived here each faced similar conditions of exclusion, which forged the beginnings of a common shared Asian experience in America. Attracted by the opportunities during the gold rush in the 19th century, Chinese laborers were the first major influx of Asian immigrants to America. Recruited as laborers, they paved railroads, nourished agriculture, and worked in industries. Many also came as entrepreneurs who developed trades and provided essential services. But they were not allowed to call America home. Long before they set foot on U.S. soil, the 1790 Nationality Act closed off eligibility for citizenship to all non-free white persons. Newly arrived Chinese were called coolies, scorned and racialized as low-wage, unfree laborers. Despite how America depended on their work for the nation's growing prosperity and actively recruited them, they were seen as disposable. When the nation experienced a severe economic recession in the 1870s, public opinion turned against the Chinese, with white Americans vilifying them as competition for their jobs and threats to their livelihood. Mass media characterized the Chinese as morally inferior, filthy, disease-ridden, unassimilable heathens who were ruining America for those who wanted the country to be a white Christian republic. This exaggerated perception led to the Page Act of 1875, which, among many goals, banned the immigration of Chinese women to America, making it more difficult for Chinese immigrants to unite their families and preventing them from planting roots. By 1876, any politician seeking California's votes had to feature a platform that staunchly opposed Chinese immigration. Riots and mass violence escalated in attempts to erode Chinese communities and led to the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. This law is still the only U.S. law that severely targets one racial group from immigrating to the U.S. and was in place for 60 years. Amid the growing anti-Chinese violence, Chinese Americans created their own communities for refuge and solidarity. With resourcefulness and resilience, they filed over 10,000 lawsuits in court, resisting the unconstitutionality of laws that singled them out for exclusion. However, legislation continued to pass, such as the Geary Act of 1892, which extended the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, with authorities mandating that all Chinese immigrants register for and carry a certificate of residence or be subject to detention and deportation. To lobby against this unjust act, journalist Wang Chen Fu founded the Chinese Equal Rights League and testified at congressional hearings. In the largest demonstration of mass civil disobedience at the time, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association organized over 100,000 Chinese individuals to collectively boycott the registration requirement. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court upheld their status as non-citizens with lesser rights, while giving federal authorities almost unlimited powers to detain and deport undocumented residents without due process. Powers that are still in use today. One of the few victories won by Chinese Americans during this period of exclusion was the legal case of United States versus Wong Kim Ark. A California-born cook named Wong Kim Ark after traveling to China, was denied re-entry to the U.S. in 1895. In this case, 
the Supreme Court ruled that the 14th Amendment granted birthright citizenship to those born in the U.S., regardless of race, ethnicity, or the citizenship status of their parents, and established birthright citizenship rights for all. Asian children in California faced exclusionary discrimination too. In 1885, Joseph and Mary Tape filed a lawsuit for their American-born daughter's right to enroll in an all-white school. The court ruled in their favor, upholding that the exclusion was a violation of California state law and the U.S. Constitution. Love also faced racial boundaries. 15 states, including Midwestern, Southern, and East Coast states, had anti-miscegenation laws directed against Asians that banned marriages between Mongolians, a term for Asians, and white Americans. With a rapidly increasing gender imbalance due to the exclusionary legislation, the Chinese American population dropped 43% from 1890 to 1920. As the number of laborers from China decreased, Japanese immigrants were recruited to fill the shortage. This caused the Japanese American population in the U.S. to grow exponentially. Koreans also arrived, but in smaller numbers, fleeing Japan's brutal colonization of their homeland. Yellow peril hatred spread to target Japanese along with Chinese. The anti-Japanese movement rose after many became successful farmers in California and also started establishing families. White labor leaders in San Francisco founded the Japanese and Korean Exclusion League. In 1905, this group was renamed as the Asiatic Exclusion League and advocated for their mission to keep America white by excluding Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, and Asian Indians. Fearful of offending Japan, which had just won the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 and wanting to expand America's influence in Asia, President Roosevelt intervened and mediated the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907. Through this agreement, Japan stopped issuing passports to future laborers in return for more inclusive treatment towards the Japanese immigrants who were already in the U.S. Japanese women were allowed to enter as picture brides, thus enabling the Japanese-American community to reduce its gender imbalance and to establish families. Since Korea was a Japanese colony, the laws for Japan applied to them as well and Korean immigration was also limited. In 1913, California enacted the Alien Land Law, barring Asian immigrants from owning land. California tightened the law further in 1920 and 1923, barring the leasing of land and land ownership by American-born children of Asian immigrant parents or by corporations controlled by Asian immigrants, depriving Asian Americans opportunities to create wealth and community. Just as Chinese individuals were antagonized as the Yellow Peril, the Asiatic Exclusion League rallied against Asian Indian immigrants, dubbing them the Dusky Peril. In September 1907, a mob of over 500 white workers drove out approximately 200 South Asians from Bellingham, Washington. Unprotected by local officials, the entire South Asian community left town. The Puget Sound American newspaper critiqued this new dusky peril as an even worse menace than the Yellow Peril because South Asians were racially categorized as Aryan or Caucasian. To restrict their immigration, Congress passed the 1917 Immigration Act and created an Asiatic barred zone that banned immigration from most of Asia. The 1924 Immigration Act went even further and banned all aliens ineligible for citizenship thereby deeply offending the Japanese government by setting aside the Gentlemen's Agreement and lumping Japanese together with other supposedly inferior Asians as unwelcome in the U.S. Many Americans, already thwarted by the alien land laws, left the U.S. The U.S. continued to admit Asians arriving to study or for political reasons. For example, future Korean President Syngman Rhee was admitted as a student and stayed on frequently campaigning in D.C. for U.S. support against a shared opponent at the time, Japan. After 1924, Filipinos were the only Asians who retained entry rights as colonial subjects of the U.S. They immigrated to the U.S. as students, workers, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. But they still faced racism in the form of legalized discrimination, mob violence, and eventually exclusion from citizenship. They filled labor shortages in U.S. fields, often alongside Mexicans, by the 1920s and 1930s. 
becoming a major labor force for West Coast agriculture. This early generation of Filipinos grew from 5,600 in 1920 to over 45,000 in 1930, and also faced intense anti-Asian hostility made worse by the Great Depression. During the 1930s, soaring unemployment and widespread poverty fueled violence against these Filipino farm workers, known as Manongs. A Watsonville, California headline proclaimed the Filipino is the state's next problem, targeting Filipinos as the third Asiatic invasion after Chinese and Japanese. White mobs and self-proclaimed vigilantes violently attacked Filipinos across California and elevated pressures for their exclusion. In 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act, known as the Philippine Independence Act, set a time frame for the Philippines to become independent, after which the U.S. could limit their immigration with an annual quota of 50 individuals per year. Asian Americans who remained in the U.S. faced many forms of racial segregation that they fought through court challenges, including for citizenship rights. The immigrants Takao Ozawa and Bagat Sin Thind took their cases all the way to the Supreme Court in 1922 and 1923, seeking citizenship by naturalization. In the highly segregationist 1920s, the Supreme Court upheld the racial bars against Asian citizenship. The citizenship restrictions also penalized American women who married Asian immigrants. Under the Expatriation Act of 1907, any American woman who marries a foreigner shall take the nationality of her husband. This law was amended with the Cable Act of 1922 after women gained suffrage with the 19th Amendment, but continued to penalize women who married aliens ineligible for citizenship. In other words, Asian immigrant men. It would take a world war for the U.S. to lift restrictions against Asians who were allies. During World War II, Chinese and Filipinos gained standing and acceptance in America through their joint war efforts. Political allegiances, along with individual merit and capacities, were starting to supersede racial discrimination in shaping immigration priorities. Association with the enemy nation of Japan, however, transformed Japanese Americans into enemy aliens who were rounded up into internment camps regardless of their citizenship status. Uprooted from their homes and hard-won farms and businesses, 120,000 Japanese Americans were confined by the U.S. government in internment camps, despite the fact that two-thirds were native-born citizens. The mass incarceration of Japanese Americans is arguably the worst civil rights violation in U.S. history. After the war, the politics of the Cold War and the civil rights movement applied pressures for the U.S. to end racial segregation and to eliminate overt racial preferences from its immigration and citizenship laws. To win allies in Asia and Africa in its war against communism, the U.S. needed to live up to the democratic ideals proclaimed in its constitution. In 1952, the racial restriction on Asian citizenship finally ended with the McCarran-Walter Act. This law provided all nations, including Asian ones, immigration quotas, and enacted for the first time preferences for family visas and skilled workers. This preference system is at the core of the 1965 hart seller Act, which still provides the main immigration conditions today. The primary pathways for legal immigration leading to citizenship are family reunification and skilled employment arranged through an employer. All nations, regardless of size, have the same annual quota of about 25,000 today. No longer facing racist barriers, Asian immigration surged after 1965, settling in many parts of America. Disproportionately, Asian immigrants often arrive already college-educated or as students for graduate studies, who can then gain employment in the U.S. For these reasons, some Asian Americans statistically bear model minority traits of high education, professional and white-collar employment, and household affluence, when the reality is more complicated in that many Asian Americans were only permitted to immigrate if they were already middle class. The 1990 Immigration Act, which introduced the H-1B Skilled Employee Visa Program, further increased this type of Asian immigration, particularly from South Asia, with many working in IT sectors. Immigrants' rights were starting to be seen as part of human rights, after the Holocaust and the realignment of many nations due to the Cold War, 
and independence for many formerly colonized Asian nations, refugees gained tremendous moral claims for legal admission and resettlement. Refugee status has often been decided on political grounds. Fleeing communism has been the most effective argument for Asians from China, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos to gain entry. With the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam in 1975 and the collapse of governments, approximately 1.25 million Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian refugees entered the U.S. from 1975 to 1994. Although legally admitted, many South and Southeast Asian Americans experience discrimination and hardship because they do not bear model minority attributes. With increased legal options for immigration, Asians in America have grown in numbers and ethnic diversity and include speakers of more than 100 different languages. Today, Asian Americans are leaders in every arena of U.S. society, culture, and government. In 2020, an Asian American was even elected to be first in the line of succession for the U.S. presidency. In many ways, past exclusion sentiments have followed us to the present. Asian Americans still face racialization as foreigners in their native land. But as generations of immigrants before us, Asian Americans are building momentum, joining in communities with one another to fight against anti-Asian sentiments and discrimination. Asian Americans and our allies have advocated for change in mainstream narratives and called for more representation in every industry and to have our stories and voices heard. Let us learn from these lessons in our past and move together toward a goal of accepting and welcoming all communities. To reach a more inclusive future in America, where all Americans are embraced as just that, Americans. <laughs>